A portion of this video is sponsored by Truebill. In a game where death is on the line, you have to win at any cost, and the contestants in Squid Game are no strangers to this idea. Throughout the show, they use some pretty creative strategies to win, but would these crafty tricks actually work in real life? We've got a lot to get through today, so let's jump right into it. So we're here to test the first game of Squid Game, and this one's pretty straightforward. It's just red light, green light. Now it seems like there's not a lot to this game in the show, but the reality is, if you don't get past this one, you don't get to play any of the rest. So is there a way to optimize our strategy, or should we do what the players in the show do? Obviously, Ilnam takes the approach of just walking the whole course, but all the other players are sprinting by the end of this thing. Is that really necessary? Did they just waste too much time at the beginning? So taking into account the average height of a Korean adult man, I approximated the distance between the back wall and the pink end zone line based on the length of the average dead guy. Then using that distance as a guide, I was able to use this overhead shot to extrapolate the length of the entire field. And since it's obviously harder with extra length, for good measure, I rounded up to 200 feet. Considering all the time wasted, I'd assume at least one to two minutes are spent with us frozen, leaving us with just over three to cross the field. And judging by how close Giyun comes to failing, that's got to be a pretty tight run, right? I started with a control test, walking the field at a leisurely pace with no stop. I walked the course in just about 60 seconds. Now, this doesn't have to be super accurate, but the point is that even if you halved the time and you took half of it and you're either like, yep, people were either frozen or people were getting shot, you still have two and a half minutes. And that was such a slow speed that I mean, like walking like this, I can pretty much stop anywhere on a dime and it's not even going to be challenging. So next I tried the old man strategy and predictably that worked like a charm. He doesn't just walk, he sort of walks like this the whole time, right? And then he goes, hmm. But can we do even better? Because you get an extra full second while the robot's head turns around, you have enough time to take a knee. So I decided to incorporate that into a new strategy of my own. See a lot of people die because they do stuff like, ah, because they're in an awkward part of their step. Really? I psyched myself out. I think that was better. It is a little bit more tiring. I mean, it's it's pretty much like squatting for the entire run. But what about Sung Woo's strategy of using other players as a meat shield? Can a trick this simple really fool the detection algorithm? And even if it works, is it fast and easy enough to do consistently? This is interesting. This is actually a little bit harder. Because I sort of have to maintain the perfect distance. I just took a huge step. After running the tests, I gave the crisp 4K footage to the WISE task force, where members Brian Smith and Repeated Failure ran it through two separate detection algorithms, and here's what we found. This algorithm is really good at detecting people, so much so that it could even tell that the little blobs running way in the distance were actually runners on a path. But when it came to detecting me, even in shots where I was waving my arms around or otherwise being goofy, this simple strategy was shockingly effective. As we approach the finish line, the robot manages to spot me because it's able to see more of my side profile. But fortunately for the show, Giyun finishes basically right next to the robot, so by my count, he'd probably get away with it. Except for that massive face plan at the end, which at least as far as we can tell, would be basically impossible to recover from. But he's doing it one-handed. Yeah, well, I'm also doing that. It's a cool moment, but it's a really bad strategy. Yeah. Conclusion is, let your friend fall, face plant into the ground. I was able to complete the course faster than the old man while also being more stable every time I stopped. So given the option, I'd say this is your best choice. Next up, we're gonna be testing the Dalgonas from Squid Game. Now, this one is particularly interesting to me because they managed to make their way through these in a number of different ways. But how many of them actually work? And of those, which one is actually the best? After spending every night for a week making the finest Dalgonas I could, that's crazy, let's go! I got to work testing every single method from the show, plus a few strategies of my own. And look, as long as I'm testing it, I really just have to call them out here. Cinema summary, your strategy sucks. There are plenty of hard objects on that playground. I bet you could even make a bowl in the sand or something on some kind of hard surface. You can already tell that it's changing color in there. Okay, some important details are maybe dissolving a little bit. That did not work that well. We've already burned through half our time. So far, so good. Not busted yet. <laughs> the easy part is always easy, and then the hard part is hard. All right, I chipped the top of the thing a little bit, but not badly enough that you'd really notice. Fuck. Mm, I totally broke the stem up. That was going so well. Yeah, no, okay. Grab a little sand from the ground. This is not my worst idea yet. It's not a great strategy. Progress is definitely being made. It really feels like we're exfoliating the, the Delgona here. All right, I snap this part a little bit. Not the best strategy, I think, is the conclusion here, 
So you can pretty much see through here. So it's pretty accurate to the thickness that it is in the show. This is harder than I thought it would be. All right, nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's pretty hard. <laughs> So obviously the next strategy employed in the show is the people who cheat using the lighter. They don't even do this on the hardest shape. Ow, hot. That works extremely well. Dude, you totally know. It looks so bad. Like the guards wouldn't be like, yup, looks normal. You're free to go. They'd be like, damn woman, you totally cheated. Crap, I only have a minute 32 left. This is so hard. Why is this hard? This was supposed to be the easy way out. And we're dead. Oh, I think we got it. I think we got it, boys. Careful. We took 15 minutes and then we still broke in a couple of different places. Whoa, that's so much faster. I bet I only really need to heat it up a little bit, just enough to like soften it and then you can kind of tell. I'd still say this is better than the traditional heat lighter method because it's a lot more efficient. Ooh, hey wait, can I just push it through? And I'm gonna go ahead and say yes, I can. We're gonna clean up the edges a little bit. I think that looks pretty good. No burn mark on the edge. It's a little bit torched on the back. It's significantly better than the other one. We still have three minutes, 26 seconds. So I think I could have been a little slower, a little more careful, and I think we would have made it through. I think we can probably just fill in this groove with a little bit of saliva, and then it'll just sort of dissolve. I kind of drag it through. It's super nasty, and I'm sorry for everyone watching at home. Oh, dude, it is definitely making it easier to like scratch away, because it, it gets way softer. This is a pretty good strat, I'm gonna be a real. Yo, there we go, call it. What, what's the timestamp? 5.56, we did that in about four minutes. Look at that, that's really clean. Making some good progress already. Sort of see that I've made a good crack near the uh, stem. It's gonna sound really weird when I say this, but after a while it starts to taste like you're licking your own saliva. That's really impressive. That's a really, really clean umbrella. It's cool that looking the honeycomb actually works, but in the show, Guillaume doesn't actually use this strap from the beginning. Instead, trying it out of desperation a mere two minutes from the end with over half of his candy left to go. With such a little time on the clock, I was really skeptical that he could have pulled this off. So I replicated the circumstances and tested it myself. Set a timer for two minutes, go. <laughs> They'll only take this out of context. We're making some good progress. I used up absolutely every second I had, but even so, it did technically work. Come on. Oh, wow, I did not think that was gonna work. I'm impressed that you can actually get through in this short of a time. I, I did not think this was gonna work at all. In a pinch, I'd still go with my spit and scratch strategy, but I really have to hand it to the show on this one. It is surprisingly accurate. On to game three. In the show, the tug of war scene is a classic underdog story. A team of misfits predicted to lose discovers an unconventional strategy that they use to gain the upper hand. But is it really all that simple? What we're gonna be doing is we are gonna be testing it for real. I've got a tug of war rope and I have a bunch of volunteers. They're gonna be helping me test this once and for all. Who's got tug of war experience? Literally nobody. We're off to a great start. I started by balancing the teams and ran a control test with no special strategy to make sure that it at least wasn't a total blowout. And once the two teams were close in performance, I put this strategy to the test. Go a good distance that way. I need you guys to come over here. So here's the deal. Basically in the show, this old man comes up with this strategy. He's, he's like, yeah, I've been playing tug of war since I was a small child. And the strategy is this. Stagger your players on both sides of the rope, feet forward, rope tucked under your armpits, and as soon as the game begins, lean back hard and thrust your pelvis to the sky. Hold like that for 10 seconds, and once your opponents lose their confidence, everyone pull as hard as you can. The idea is that by taking advantage of your opponent's cockiness, you can catch them off guard and gain an advantage in the fight. But in a game so based in raw strength, can something this simple really secure you the dub? Okay, all right, everybody. All right, cool, everybody hang tight. I'll be back in a second. In the show, they use this special tug of war strategy that's supposed to make them like better at the game and uh, like, like win. But I've done a little bit of background research and it's actually probably pretty unlikely to work. Um, so you guys are just gonna have to commit to the regular play style. Like they're gonna be doing this special thing. Pretty much ignore it, okay? You just have to commit 110% to this, all right? We're back. I've conferred with both of the teams. Now we're gonna play another round and see what happens. Three, two, one, pull. Ah, oh, okay, let's try this again. Let's try it, round it up, round it up. You're good, you're good. 
I'm gonna have you guys do one thing. I'm gonna have you guys switch sides of the field real quick. Guys, you got this, okay? You got this, you got this. Three, two, one. Pull, lean, <laughs> no! The good news is, I just wanted to make sure that the ground was not making a difference, like that a slight slope or slight slipperiness wasn't making a big difference. But we're trying to like even it out a little bit. All right, we've rebalanced the teams. I feel a little better about this. I think it's possible that you guys could pull away with the dub here. Feeling, yeah, everybody, feet forward, hands together. You guys don't do any of that. We're gonna start in three, two, one, go. Come on, pelvis to the sky! <laughs> no, that didn't go anywhere. I feel like this is a vastly inferior strategy. Am I am I crazy? Did it feel harder to like hold your place? It's like you can't go back. Yeah, you can't place. pull back enough. Yeah, let's have you guys lean back pretty far already. You guys are just gonna have to hold it. Three, two, one, pull. Nope. Nope. No. No, 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 no. It seems like a really bad strategy. We also tried using the step forward they do in the show. Go. Ah, yeah. oh, man. I think it's too hard to like regain the friction though. We also tried some alternative strategies, but none of them seemed to help. If there's any perfect tug of war strategy, it should work regardless of surface, regardless of teammates. And I think what we're learning is that ultimately, tug of war, well, strategy matters. Like, ultimately, it's about having a team of people who are pretty darn strong, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. And if my testing wasn't enough for you, this Korean YouTuber tested it on concrete and they found basically the same thing. As much as I really want to believe in this, it just seems like it isn't true. On to the next game. When it comes to marbles, we can't really test strategies shown in the show because all of the games played were either games of chance or skill. If you're a great marble thrower, the game Doc Sue picks is probably a good choice, but he's still gambling on the fact that he's better than his opponent. The best strategy is to pick a game you know you won't lose. What's up? You wanna play a quick game of marbles with me? So here's how this works, right? We're gonna have two piles of marbles on the table. You get 10 marbles, I get 10 marbles. You win by taking the last marble on the table. I'm gonna take one from each. Okay. No matter what I do, it doesn't matter, but... You're thinking, why is there thinking involved? This is a game of skill. I'll go first. Okay, go. The first move for me is usually the hardest. After that point, it starts to get really easy. I'm gonna take two from here. So my only move is to take this marble. Yeah, but you're still screwed, because I take both. Right. Yeah, either way I go... No matter what you do, I win here. Okay, cool. Oh, well that sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> This is a game called Withops Game. It's technically a version of Nim, which you can learn more about here, but we don't have time to go into all the math behind it. So the short version is this. It's mathematically rigged, and here's how you win. To play, first create two unequal piles of marbles. Then take turns removing marbles from the piles. You can take as many marbles as you like from pile A, or from pile B, or from both piles. But if you take from both, you must take from both equally. Whoever takes the last marble or marbles from the piles is the winner. <laughs> I seem to be in a predicament. Do you want to take the first move? You want me to take the first move? Do you have a preference? Offer your opponent the free choice of going either first or second. This suggests it's not rigged, but in reality, you'll be able to win either way. It's up to I'll you. I'll the first move. All right. All you need to do is make a move such that at the end of your turn, the piles on the tables have marbles corresponding to one of the sets of numbers on this list. One and two, three and five, four and seven, or six and ten. Once you reach one of these combinations, as long as you continue following these sets, your opponent will be unable to win, because no matter what they do, you'll always be able to reach the next closest set. And when faced with the option of one comma two, your opponent has no choice <laughs> but to lose. Once you reach one of these combinations, as long as you continue following these sets, your opponent will be unable to win, because no matter what they do, you'll always be able to reach the next closest set. And it's all over. Yep. So after dunking on four guys in my makerspace, I decided to test my new powers on the most powerful man in the universe, Daps. There was no other way I'd be able to win against him, so I figured if I challenged him to this game, I might have a fighting chance. You want to go first or second? I'll go first. Alright, go ahead. What's your move? Hmm, I'm going to take a nine from pile B. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, okay, I am going to, I'm gonna take two from each. I'm gonna take four from pile A. Four from A. Dang, dang it. All right, I'm gonna take one from each. And Dab schools me again. It's true. 
He's truly unbeatable. Come on, this is supposed to be rigged. I'm supposed to beat you. I am far too powerful for you, puny mortal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's what happens when you play against someone who does know this strat. But I mean, this is dabs we're talking about. In real life, that's not gonna happen. On to the next game. Welcome to game five of Squid Game, Glass Stepping Stones. This is only for two panels. In the show, this thing is 16 panels long. I did some painstaking pixel measurements over every part of this shot to determine exactly how thick and how long and all the size constraints for these exact panels so we could test them just like the show. The average foot width of a Korean man is approximately four inches. When we see our first contestant land on a panel, we can use this reference to determine that the beams the glass rests on are about two inches wide. And then in turn, the globe-shaped light bulbs are around three inches in diameter, matching a standard G25 light bulb in size. When the shot switches to the side, we can see that the channel is slightly wider than the bulbs, and a conservative estimate puts us at about a quarter inch on either side, making the lip of the beams roughly 3 16 of an inch thick. And with the glass resting on top, we can see that that is roughly three times the thickness of that beam, putting it somewhere between 1 half and 5 eighths of an inch. Since 5 eighths isn't a standard thickness for glass, the thickness is probably 1 half inch. Looking at the panels again from above, we can use the width of the beams to determine the size of each panel and the gap between them. 46 inches long by 42 inches wide with about a 38 inch gap. Today we're gonna find out whether you can actually tell the difference between these kinds of panels and see if any of the strategies from the show would help you get across. And finally, see if we can find some of our own strategies that would guarantee you a win. All right, let's get into it. In the show, they claim to be able to tell the tempered glass from regular in a couple ways. First by sound, and then by using the reflections. So Jack and I got to work trying both ways to see if we could tell the difference. In the show, they talk about specifically the way that light refracts through the glass. However, as far as I can tell, they are exactly the same. Like, I can sort of see the beams above me on this back porch reflecting in the glass, and like, I mean, oh wait, actually, I think I might have just found something. Whoa, okay, hold up, hold up. So tempered glass has like internal stresses in the glass, which might mean that the way that the light reflects through it is less like linear, less like clear and a little more wavy. And as I move my like head around, you can actually see the reflection, like the, the lines of the, they almost look like shadows. Uh, in the glass, they're a lot straighter on the side with the annealed glass. If we come over here, you can see like almost little tiny ripples in the glass. Yeah, you can totally see like a big wave roll through almost. I think we should try to get a couple other random people and see if they can tell if we tell them what the key is. All right, so I'm here with Danny now. This is a piece of tempered glass. Over here is a piece of annealed glass. You see how like the reflection almost has like, almost like a ghost image there? Yeah. There are, you can sort of see a little bit of rippling on that edge. Yeah. And if you look at the same thing in this, see how that's like a perfectly straight line? Yep. That's, that's the difference. These, I'm not gonna tell you which is which, and I want you to take your best guess. I think this is tempered. You think this one's tempered? Yeah. You're absolutely right. It is. That's awesome. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> it works. I'm not going to tell you which is which. So, wavy, tempered. You know, if your, if your theory holds up, yeah. then right here, I can see it. One. I think this is the wavy one, so the one on the right. You're absolutely right. You're not like a glass expert. You yeah. don't know anything yeah. about this. I want to look at that one. Yeah, go for it. I'm telling you, it'll be straight. Yeah, absolutely. Like dead on. Yeah. And while it doesn't help the characters in Squid Game, we did discover this really cool effect with polarized glasses. Oh my gosh! Dude, it's like x-ray vision. Here, look through the lens of those glasses. Look over, nothing. See those giant ripples? I think the other thing we want to test is whether you can tell by sound, because that was one of the other big things that they talked about in the show. We don't know which ones are which. Here's this one. Okay, here is the other one. No difference to me. You have no idea, right? Not a clue. Do you hear a difference? <laughs> okay. No. So I'm gonna go ahead and say this is completely busted. I definitely can't tell the difference. I mean, maybe if you've years and years of experience. So one of the things that I've heard a lot of people talk about is, okay, well, you could just stand on the beams and just walk across in the middle. And while I think that's true to some degree, the problem here is that you'll get shot. One thing that nobody has talked about, as far as I can tell, is that these two types of panels are both absurdly thick. 
Like, this is a half inch tempered glass panel, which they're obviously using for the safety of the actors. That means that the annealed glass panels have to be the exact same thickness and size because they have to look identical. Every one of these bags weighs 50 pounds. There's one. All right, there's two bags. So this will be a little more than my body weight. This will be 150 pounds. Yeah, and I mean, this is showing no signs of breaking. All right, they say in the show it should hold two people. Ugh. Last bag. And that right there is 300 pounds of weight. So I feel very confident that I can stand on this, and I'm going to. That feels pretty solid. Does it look like it's Boeing? This is a piece of non-tempered glass, and if the show is to be believed, before we even put about 150 pounds on here, this should shatter. So I'm going to start loading up bags of sand as carefully as I can. And I'm going to try to load them right in the middle. So that's 50 pounds. This is going to be another 50 pounds. This third bag, if it works, means this should theoretically hold my weight. Okay, we're gonna add another bag. This will be roughly 200 pounds. All right, this will be 250 pounds. Holy crap. I thought for sure it would break under that. <laughs> I'm gonna throw one more on here. This is all we have. This is all the weight we have. That is 300 pounds of sand on half inch non-tempered glass, which says to me, I'm probably not gonna fall through it, but I don't wanna risk my life on it. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is 150 pounds of Lewis standing on theoretically unstandable glass. I mean, this says to me that what we're talking about works. All right, let's try to break this guy and see what it takes, and then we're gonna try to move across the panel if I can get myself off of here. Now, this shouldn't break because in the show, they eat themselves across these pieces of glass like, you know, it's nobody's business. Three, two, one. Yes! Look at that, that was like, it didn't even like wiggle. That was like, pfft, no sweat. Let's see what happens if I drop 50 pounds from like up here. This isn't gonna be a super hard contact, but let's find out. So, what did we just learn? Is that if you yeet yourself across the gap, you will probably break the panels. If you're able to gingerly step your way across, you probably won't. I, I know in my head this should work, but I'm still a little nervous because of the way we're gonna be like edge loading. Take it nice and easy. Let's go. Nobody wants to see my bare ass feet, but it's what they do in the show. So it's what we're doing in real life. The things I do for you people. Let's go! All right, we're going back. <laughs> My right foot is sweating. <laughs> Hello. You may notice that I'm back. So as cool as it was to step from one panel to the other, since in the show they jumped this multiple times, I want to try jumping it. This, like, concerns me just the slightest bit. All right. That was pretty solid. All right, I think we kind of just have to do it. If this works, I think we can guarantee that math teacher would have survived his jumping strap. Okay. That was a jump. Let's go. Oh, I gotta call that, guys. You can do it. You don't even have to step carefully. You can just jump them. You can just jump them. Dude, that is super cool. And also, it means Squid Game is totally busted. That is how you beat Squid Game, right there. Casually saunter your way across all 16 sections of bridge and you win. Welcome to game six of Squid Game. We're out here, once again, with a full two scale Squid Game court like from the show. Now, not every Squid Game court is the same size, so we did measurements of the actual screenshots from the show to figure out about how big this one should be. You might say the show doesn't really have a secret strategy, and that's definitely true. However, if you were put in this situation, what would be the best strategy for you to employ? And also, does Guillaume make the right decision by asking for attacker instead of defender when he wins the coin toss? That's what we're gonna try to find out. 
This game plays a lot like football, minus the tackling. So to test it for ourselves, my intern Jack reached out to a friend of his named Noah, a high school football player who was able to teach us some strategies to dodge and block in real life. And once we had some basic chops, we started running tests. This is just like messed up. You're just like there. There's no like, I just have to. Oh, you made it. Oh wait, I can use both feet yeah, now. You made it. Let's go. This is a lot, I think, more challenging 1v1, because, like... <laughs> <laughs> that's hard. No, that's hard, though. All right, let's switch. Despite compelling arguments by people on the internet and even amongst ourselves for either side, there's not really a universal perfect choice. <laughs> that, was a, that was a little too easy for Jack. If you're agile but not strong, probably pick attack. If you're strong but not agile, go with defense. But either way, you're just going to have to get good. Thanks everyone for watching and thanks to Truebill for sponsoring. I'll see you next time.